Hey pals, I'm here today to talk about my favourite reads of 2023. This video is a little bit later than I hoped it would be because I managed to catch Covid on New Year's Eve um, and Johnny and I both had it and we weren't actually too unwell but you know I looked and sounded pretty rough so I just slept lots and chilled at home and we are both fine now and um, yeah sort of excited to get back into the swing of things. I really love this time of year on booktube watching everyone's favourite books of the year videos and their plans for the new year so I will have another video in a few days talking about my um, sort of wrap up of 2023 and my plans for 2024. Just briefly I'll say that I read 85 books in 2023 and I gave 10 five star ratings, but five of those were for rereads. So in this video, I'll be talking about the five books I gave five stars that I hadn't read before. And I also have three honorable mentions. Now these were books that I considered giving five stars and I went back and forth, but ultimately I just felt like they weren't like all the others. There wasn't really anything I could critique and there were slight things I could critique about these three but I really enjoyed them and I would still say I loved them and would really recommend them. So I would like to mention them here. So the first one I'm gonna mention, and I will have spoken about this in the Booker Prize or wrap up video I did, and that is All the Little Bird Hearts by Victoria Lloyd Barlow. This is actually the only one I don't own. I listened to this in an audio, which I'd highly recommend. The audiobook narrator, whose name I will put here, was amazing. And yeah, I would definitely recommend going down that route. So I need to get myself a copy of this book because it's a book I would definitely like to have on my shelves. I uh, will talk about this briefly because I've already spoken about it. And also you've probably heard lots about it. This is told from the perspective of a woman called Sunday, who is neurodivergent. And she has a teenage daughter who is starting to sort of break away from Sunday a little bit and start to make it clear that she finds certain elements of Sunday's personality frustrating. When some new neighbours move in next door, who are middle-aged, middle-class and childless, and they insinuate themselves very quickly into the life of Sunday and her daughter Dolly. And initially, Sunday sort of welcomes them with open arms because they're quite different to the people she's used to. A lot of people in her life treat her quite poorly and make her very aware that she makes them feel uncomfortable. And these new neighbours are the opposite and are really blunt and honest, which is something she much prefers when communicating with others. And so very quickly, they become really enmeshed in each other's lives but you realise as the reader that there is perhaps a dark undercurrent and something about Sunday's life that they themselves desire and so you sort of watch um, this sense of dread build. I absolutely loved this writing style, this is one of those books where I started reading it and was immediately like god this is just precisely the sort of writing style I really enjoy. Very much like Slice of Life, really small details, lots of descriptions of like what a room looked like and what the food they were eating and what it looked and tasted like. I also love books that have a lot of dialogue and this book has lots of dialogue and also one of the reasons I really love the audio is because Sunday pays a lot of attention to the way in which people talk, the way in which um, different people communicate and so she comments a lot on people's accents and the way people pronounce certain words and on audio that came across really well and I really enjoyed it. The only reason this wasn't a five star read for me was because I felt that the final third was a bit weaker than the first two thirds and that's because you sort of know where this novel's going and I was expecting it to maybe pull the rug out from under me and go a bit further than I thought it would and it, it doesn't do that so you sort of read with this building sense of dread and it goes where you expect it to go but I still really enjoyed it will 100% pre-order whatever this author brings out in the future and yeah excited to watch her career so there is that one. The next one and this is the one I considered the most giving five stars and I actually feel quite cruel I didn't I mean all this stuff is kind of arbitrary and I am forever swinging between the idea of not even using star ratings but anyway I sort of do it because it's like an easy shorthand for people to know how much I love the book. This is Ordinary Human Failings by Megan Nolan. I pre-ordered this one and uh, picked it up as soon as it arrived. This is her second novel. I read and enjoyed her first novel Acts of Desperation but I definitely preferred this one. The premise of this is this is set in the 90s in London and there is this apartment block where a journalist is staying to have a one night stand and he finds out the next morning that a young girl has been killed, they think by another young girl she was playing with and the girl who is accused of killing her is part of this um, Irish family who are not really liked by the community who live in the apartment block and he decides oh this could be the story that makes my career and so his um, 
uh, newspaper pay for this Irish family to be whisked away to a hotel and they're led to believe that's being done, like paid for by the police but actually the paper are paying for it to try and get all the sort of gruesome details of how they raised this murderer. Now I don't want to give the idea that this book is really about the crime because it really isn't. What this book is about is ordinary human failings. You are following the, the mother of this child who had the child when she was very young, her brother and her father and you find out what their life was like in Ireland, how they all were sort of led to this point and how they have really poor relationships with one another and all feel really sort of defeated by life but because of these ordinary human failings they haven't had these really sort of big tragically sad events happen to them which is sort of what the journalist wants to find out about instead they've had these ordinary human failings these ordinary moments of sadness and they just haven't been able to raise their head above water after those moments have happened this book is very thoughtful the writing style is excellent i tabbed a few sections just about the sort of the way someone's mind works. I think she, she wrote really beautifully and I'm really excited to see where she goes and I really think this book deserved more attention. I was surprised it wasn't on the book along list. I just think it's really excellently written and just a really thoughtful and precise book. So yeah, I would definitely recommend this one. Next we have Penance by Eliza Clark. This is another second novel and this is another one I pre-ordered and read as soon as it arrived. Her first novel was Boy Parts, which I listened to an audio and really enjoyed. As soon as I heard about the premise of this one, I was so excited about it. And yeah, it was a wild ride reading this one. I really enjoyed it. The premise of this is, is that it's being written by a male journalist who has previously published a couple of really successful true crime books. And he's been trying to find a crime that hasn't been um, spoken about too much already. And he comes across this murder that took place in a small um, seaside village in Northern England where three teenage girls brutally murdered another teenage girl. And it didn't really make headlines at the time because a lot of other things were going on in England that sort of were, were taking all the, all the front page news. And so he's like, great, there's this story I can write. When you start reading the book, there is an introduction, supposedly by his publisher, saying when this book was originally published, loads of people came forward saying that it was really inaccurate and he'd made up things that they said. And so it was pulled from the shelves. But the publisher has decided to republish it with that note at the front so that you as the reader can go in and decide what to believe and what not to believe. So as you're reading, you're sort of really pulled in by what you're being told, but at all points you're questioning what you're being told, which I think is really interesting. So there's sort of two layers to this. The, the, I guess the base layer is just uh, the crime itself. And rather than asking um, who did it, this, this book is asking why and how. And so the book is mainly structured around three girls committed the murder but a fourth was also accused and he introduces them as girls A, B, C and D and you have these sections where you hear their stories and there is moments when we're really zoomed out and we zoom out even on the town they live in and there's these sort of shorter chapters that really dive into a certain element of the town and read as like a historical or like tourist document and then there's elements where he really zooms in. As, as we get through the book we get closer to the actual crime itself and the aftermath. This book is full of trigger warnings. This book is the limit of what I could read in terms of violence. It's, it's quite abhorrent and the discussions of what teenage girls can do to one another, not even just in terms of physical violence, but in terms of the, the, the horrific effect of bullying was really hard to read and just, just so precisely done and really reminded me of the elements of being a teenage girl that I hated and how cruel girls could be to one another. And yeah, I had a great time reading it. This wasn't a five-star read for me because I felt that ultimately the payoff of the sort of more um, meta structure wasn't entirely successful. Like you're expecting there to be this additional reveal or twist and there isn't. And so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this, but I was expecting like a bigger impact right at the end. Um, but I'd still recommend it if it sounds like a book that you think you could stomach. So before we move on to the top five, I just want to say that <laughs> I fear my voice still sounds a little bit croaky. So I apologise for that, but I don't want to keep putting off getting back into doing videos because... Yeah, I, I have lots of video plans and I'm excited to do them, so I, I hope you can put up with my voice. So, the next book, funnily enough, I finished Penance um, one evening and I immediately was like, God, I want to read more books like that. And so I went online and tried to look into more books like that. And the first one that came up, as soon as I read the blurb, I was like, this sounds amazing. It had only been out for a few weeks. I hadn't heard of it before. And so it was too late for a bookshop to be open. So I immediately got it on audio, started listening to it. And if I love a book on audio, I tend to then, if, I, if it's really lyrical, 
I tend to then buy a copy and read along with the audio, which is what I did the next day I went into the city and picked up this, this physical copy. And that is Carla by Colin Walsh. Now I find this quite amusing because these were probably published around the same time, so neither of them copied the other, but both of them have like three teenagers on with one of them with her face scribbled off. So um, yeah, I, I think they're both good covers, but just funny that they're quite similar and also um, have, you know, similar themes. So the premise of this one is that in what year, in 2003, in a small town in Ireland called Kinlau, there were six teenagers, three girls, three boys who were inseparable and they absolutely adored one another and just were really tangled up in each other's lives. Then one of them, Carla, went missing. Um, she was never found, nobody ever knew what happened to her and it really changed each of their lives dramatically and they never really figured out how to move on from that. Then in the present day, Three of the remaining five um, are all coming back to Kinlau. One of them still lives there and he works in his mum's cafe, and that is Mish. And then Joe is coming back because he is a pretty famous um, uh, singer-songwriter and he's coming back to perform a couple of gigs. And Helen is a journalist in Canada who focuses on uh, violence against women. She's coming back because her father is getting remarried. And you get these three different perspectives and as they arrive there is a housing development being built and as the foundations are being dug a body is found and they immediately assume this body must be Carla and so this book is a really close focus um, it is set around the space of I think around a week in the present day but you, all three of them look back and reminisce about this summer where they knew Carla and what happened to her and through each of their stories you find out what actually happened to Carla and things get pretty mad in the present day, like towards the end, there is a lot more plot to this. This is definitely not like a thriller. It's a, a sort of literary thriller. It's beautifully written, super lyrical. Some people would perhaps find this overwritten and I thought it was beautiful. I highly recommend the audio. In particular, the person who narrates Mush, it's just brilliant. And I'm not sure who that is because I hate, when you listen to an audio book, and it has several narrators, you don't know like which one was which voice, so that's slightly annoying, but all three of them did a really good job, but Mish in particular had a really beautiful voice. This book, again, examines um, what teenage friendship is like, but this was interesting to read right after Penance because there are certain sections in this book where Mush spends time with three girls without the other two boys there, and what he witnesses is the sort of wonderful aspects of female friendship, how kind and compassionate and sort of forgiving girls are compared to boys and how he can drop any charade and not worry about appearing too feminine and he just loves being with them so it was quite nice um, to have that as like a mirror to how horrific girls could be in penance. So I really enjoyed this. In a few reviews I saw people say that like you know this examines a lot of themes that we've seen examined before like sort of small town politics and, and class and, and, and these types of things and, I, and it doesn't do anything different and I, I sort of see that point but I just love the way this was written, I love the characters, I think it all pulled together really well. There's also a couple of moments in this book that I don't want to spoil. They're not necessarily supernatural but they're not sort of physically possible and they're moments you could miss but, and I did in fact miss a couple of them and I was talking to Amelia um, whose channel I highly recommend, her channel's called Amelia Barlow Books, we have really similar reading taste, um, I'll link her channel above, and she just read this and I was messaging her about it and she mentioned one of those scenes that I hadn't even noticed, so there's um, quite a lot of layers within this and it was really cool to be like oh god yeah that was really interesting as well and so there's lots of commentary on this book about how you are so affected by your past um, and that the, how this one person who's no longer even there can have such an impact on your life and yeah I, I just really loved it and would highly recommend it. The next book is the only non-fiction book that made the list and it's also the only book that wasn't published in 2023. This was published I think in 2022 so it's still fairly recent and that is Run Towards the Danger Confrontations with the Body of Memory by Sarah Poli. I picked this up because I heard Jill over at the book bully rave about it. I'll try and find the video where she talks about it and link it above and um, I'm so glad I took Jill's recommendation because yeah this is probably my favourite read of 2023. This is an essay collection. I think there are six fairly long form essays in this. And if you were not aware, which I wasn't before um, I had Jill talk about this, Sarah Poli was a child actor. Uh, she's a Canadian. 
and she was Anne in the original Anne of Green Gables series and then she is now a writer-director. Um, her most recent film was Woman Talking. So this book I guess has three main themes that are all sort of interwoven throughout the essays. One of those themes is discussing child acting and I guess the ethical implications of child acting. There is one point where she says she has a lot of parents talk to her now and say oh my child wants to be an actor um like you know what do you think and she says her, her response is always well don't let them be um don't let them you know send them to a summer camp where they can act but don't allow them to be paid and to work you know as a child that 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 can never be ethical um and you know she says that whenever she says that to somebody she can always tell they're disappointed because that isn't what they want to hear because Obviously, the temptation of their child being great and famous and successful and also bringing money in is great. And so what they want her to say is, oh, no, you should do it, but just be aware of these things. So she dives into that a lot. And that was something that I'd really been thinking out about a lot since I read um, Jeanette McCurdy's memoir, I'm Glad My Mum Died. And she didn't dive into that as much as I wanted her to, because, of course, the memoir was more about her relationship with her mother. But um, Sarah Polly dives into it a lot more in this. So she talks about the ethical implications of it. And she one of the things she says is when one of the parents said to her, oh, but they really want to act like that's what they want to do. She says, but your child could want to be a doctor, but you tell them they have to wait um, and, and train as an adult until they can do it. So like, why would we allow them to do it? And it's even more interesting because as someone who like loves film and TV, I, you know, sometimes really enjoy a child's role in a film. And so there's this push and pull between me sort of, um, I guess, almost taking advantage of these child actors by wanting them in films, but then also questioning the, the ethics of that. So that's something I'm trying to think about a lot more as I choose which films to watch and support. Um, and the other two aspects of this is, is one, her really complex relationship with her parents, in particular her father. Her mother died when she was quite young and her siblings were all quite a lot older than her. So she ended up living with her father um, alone and he almost sort of let her raise herself and they had a really um, odd relationship and he treated her almost as an adult. And I think she's actually made a documentary about her relationship with her father, which I really need to watch. What I really admired about her talking about her family is that she still has a relationship with them. And I sort of admire all of them for the the ability she's had to be sort of brutally honest, but also quite compassionate and forgiving about the fact that they did what they could with the skills and the knowledge they had at the time, um, but still not shy away from acknowledging the pain that's caused her. And then the third aspect of the essays is talking about um, traumatic incidents, um, in particular PTSD, and how that manifests in the body as, as physical pain. So she has issues with chronic pain that she's trying to get diagnosed, um, and one essay in particular focuses on that. And... Um, that is the title of one of the essays, Run Towards the Danger, because when she does receive a diagnosis, this doctor says to her, you need to run towards the danger. And that's something I really grappled with when I read this, because I, I also have a diagnosis for a condition that is, uh, you know, my symptoms are chronic pain. And when I can feel a flare up coming, I don't do the things that are causing the flare up. Um, and her doctor tells her that by giving in to that, she's letting her body become used to not being pushed and, and so she has to instead push through it which is something that you know I think you really have to consider on a case-by-case -case basis and her diagnosis is not the same as mine um, but I thought the way in which she spoke about that was really interesting and I think what I took from this is she's incredibly intelligent but, but in particular she's so thoughtful and um, every aspect of what she's discussing in this you get the impression that if you met her She'd be more than willing to have a conversation. She wouldn't be staunch in her own opinion. Um, and she'd be more than willing to go down every avenue to discuss a different angle. And that's something I really admire in Essay Collection because it allows you as a reader to be really freeform with your thoughts about what they're talking about. Um, so yeah, I, I love this and will definitely follow her career and um, read whatever she releases in the future. Then probably the buzziest book on my favourite reads of the year is Burn and Wood by Eleanor Catton. This is one I borrowed from the library and really enjoyed. So then I bought myself a physical copy to own. And this is one that ever since I finished it, I've been considering rereading because it is a bit of a mad ride towards the end. And it would sort of be cool to reread it knowing what's coming. So as I said, this is quite popular. So I will try and briefly describe it, although it's quite difficult to describe. There is this, it's set in New Zealand, and there is this guerrilla gardening group who are uh, this sort of local collective and they plant 
um, edible crops on private land that is not being utilised. Um, so they are, uh, I guess, socialist in their beliefs um, and they have been trying for a long time to take the next step with their organisation and, and make more of an impact on the world. And that hasn't been happening. But then there is a landslide um, on an area of land owned by this married couple and that landslide blocks off this, this whole section of arable land. So Mira, the manager of this guerrilla gardening group, Burnham Wood, goes there and realises, oh my God, this is the big break we've been waiting for. There's all this land. We can do this in secret until the landslide is cleared. And she decides, yeah, this is what I'm going to do to try and save Burnham Wood. When she's there, she runs into a billionaire who is also there. And he is super corrupt, as all billionaires are. He has made his money by nefarious means. He's against everything that she believes in, but he offers them a significant sum of money to put into Burnham Wood. That money is nothing to him, but it's a lot to them. So from that point on, you follow Mira, who runs, who was, you know, the, the person who started Burnham Wood, Shelley, who's her best friend, who really actually manages Burnham Wood, does all the admin, does all the finances. You also follow the billionaire, you follow the married couple who own the land, and then there's another uh, perspective, and that is um, a young man who was one of the original founders of Burnham Wood, but has since gone travelling um, and written like uh, travel journalism, but hasn't been as successful as he hoped. And he comes back just as they're accepting all this money from the billionaire, and he's really the, um, the voice saying, this goes against everything we believe in, what are we doing? So that's the premise. I've heard a lot of people say they found this book boring and dry and it took them a lot of time to get through and I really cannot relate to that at all. I read the first couple of pages and it's quite a weird introduction because you're introduced to, to the area of land where the landslide has happened, which is not that captivating. And I usually think it's better to introduce us to a character first. But by page four, I was hooked. I read this very quickly. I found it super readable. She's clearly incredibly intelligent. There's lots of long words in this. There's lots of debates um, between the collective of Burnham Wood and everyone in the room is clearly really intelligent. But there's also this feeling of them all being really vocal and really wordy in their beliefs, but actually not putting much of it into action. So there's lots of question of what it means to be, um, you know, really left wing if all you do is talk about these things but not really do them um, and then there's this uh, you know big analysis of the idea of um, you know capitalism and if that is selling out taking the money and on top of all those layered discussions there is a really crazy uh, finale that feels a bit like a Quentin Tarantino film if Quentin Tarantino was a woman and wasn't you know a bit offensive. Something else I really enjoyed in this is the discussion about the relationship between Mira and Shelley and the fact that Mira wants to be a woman who likes spending time with women but actually what she really enjoys is being admired by men and how that sort of goes against her politics. And there's lots of discussion about the friendship between Mira and Shelley and lots of this book feels quite sort of stream of consciousness you really get in people's heads. This would be an excellent mini series if it was done well. So yeah this was just a wild ride and I would already like to reread it. And this next one is sort of the opposite and I've barely heard anyone talk about this and I would love to hear more people read it because I think a lot of people would enjoy it. This is another one I borrowed from the library and then bought myself a copy of and that is Bellies by Nicola Denan. The premise of this is that at a university drag night Tom and Ming who are presenting as two gay men meet one another and fall in love. You then watch their relationship over the following years um, in, in many different locations as they are together and apart. And the, the main thrust of the storyline is that soon after um, getting with Tom, Ming decides to transition and she starts that process. And it really shapes the foundations of their relationship because Tom is a gay man who is attracted to other men. And as Ming transitions and becomes more and more feminine, Tom still truly loves Ming and wants Ming to be happy. And if that means transitioning, then Tom wants her to do that. But Tom becomes less attracted to Ming. This book is brilliant, I think, in that it discusses a really difficult topic, but does it all with a real lack of judgment and allows you to see from both Tom and Ming's perspective and also the, the surrounding friendship group and, and really understand how heartbroken they all are by the circumstances but also at the same time heartbroken about how something that is making Ming so happy is sort of breaking this relationship up. Um, and there is there is sort of attempts within this novel 
um, for them to continue to be together and you sort of watch as they try to do that. You see it from both of their perspectives. And I just, I loved this. I, I loved Nicola Danan's writing style. I loved all the discussion and um, discussion points. One of the um, discussion points in the novel that I thought was handled really well is that um, Ming is um, British Malaysian. Um, so her mother was Malaysian and her father's British, but he still lives in Malaysia um, and her mother died. And as she transitions, she keeps looking in the mirror and, and sort of seeing her mother standing in front of her and feels really saddened by the fact that her mother never got to see her um, as a woman. There's also discussions about the fact that she feels the most at home in Malaysia, but isn't really accepted there, um, either for being a gay man or for being a trans woman, um, and the difficulty of not feeling safe in the place you call home. So I just loved all the discussions and I loved Nicola Danan's writing style because she is really brilliant. Number one, brilliant at dialogue. I have realised over the last couple of years that I really love a lot of dialogue in books and she's really great at that. But also what I really enjoyed is she is brilliant at describing food and clothes and decor. I could see everything she described, taste everything she described. It was just beautiful. And all of Ming's outfits just sounded amazing. Again, I think this might have even been picked up to be made into a TV series, but this would definitely be a brilliant TV series. This is getting comparisons to Sally Rooney, and I think that happens a lot, and I am always feel a bit bad for authors when they're compared to someone super successful and famous, because I think it really simplifies the craft. However, what I will say is I think Nicola Dan's writing style is quite different, but I think if you like that sort of um, messy millennial story that really um, dives into the mindset, of these people, then that is definitely what Nicola and Danan is doing. This book made me really cry. There was a, a whole scene at the end that is incredibly sad, which I will not spoil, um, and I felt heartbroken by it. So um, this really pulled the emotions out of me. I also love the meaning of the title being bellies. There is a section when they discuss that Ming has never really felt comfortable like truly revealing herself to somebody, um, but she feels able to sort of um, reveal her belly like um, mammals do like for example if you have cats or dogs when they're really happy and comfortable with you they roll over and reveal their bellies um, to show that they feel safe with you and that's how Ming feels with Tom and I, I just loved all that um, discussion and like this book was just really heartbreaking and yeah I'd happily reread this one as well. And then lastly we have a book that I really didn't think I'd read and um, this was a really buzzy book did this come out I'm pretty sure this is a 2023 release early 2023 but I'm worrying now that it's actually no, it was 2022, this one, so I do have two 2022 books. And I'm, I'm annoyed with myself, so I just realised there is the remnants of a sticker on this that I, um, I'm really rubbish at getting off, like, um, sticker residue. So I always get Johnny to do it for me, and I forgot to ask. So apologies about the fact that you're going to see a bit of sticker. Um, this book is The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty. I think it was Waterstones Book of the Year in 2022. And, yeah, it's really odd, because I kept hearing about this one, and I just kept thinking, nah, I just don't think I'll like it. It sounds like... I don't know, I just wasn't sure. And I don't really know why that is because I actually love this book and I heard Chris over at Chris's Bookish Cauldron talk about it. We have quite similar reading taste, so I was like, I'm gonna trust Chris and give this a go. I listened to this one on audio and this was another one that is very lyrically written. There's a lot of words. Um, and so I decided to read this alongside the audio. So I bought myself a copy. And this was a wild ride. Um, Again, this one was quite popular, so I will discuss the premise briefly. This is set in one week in July in a fictional town called Vacavale, no, Vacavale um, in Indiana. And this town is a town that was um, incredibly vibrant and wealthy um, during a period of uh, industry boom um, and since then has sort of um, become really tired and, uh, and defeated. And you are following an apartment block called the Rabbit Hutch and you are following um, several people who live in that apartment block and also a couple of characters who are, for reasons, heading towards um, that apartment block. And the main thrust of the novel is that the book opens um, with the description, the rather horrific description, of a young girl called Blondine, who is, I think, around 17 years old, um, being brutally murdered by three teenage boys she shares an apartment with. And then you go back to the week before and build back towards that moment. This is probably the book on the list that I think the most people would hate. I think this book is a real love it or hate it book. It is incredibly lyrical. Um, it does read a little bit like somebody who was on one of those like creative writing master's courses in the US. 
it is probably could be described as pretentious a lot of the descriptive writing entails lists which is something i can either really get on board with or really dislike i loved it in this book i will actually say if you just pick it up in a bookshop and read the first two pages you'll know if you'll enjoy this book or not because that first two pages really is indicative of the writing style one of the things I thought I could struggle with in this is that Blondine is incredibly intelligent and precocious and she knows every single fact and she spouts all of those facts a lot but she also has a real interest in female saints and so she talks a lot about um, female saints and sort of their history and that could perhaps be a tad annoying but actually I think it really worked. This book is really hard to talk about because it has so many themes but this book really reminded me of Ohio by Stephen Markley. Both books are set in a, a town in America that is a sort of struggling financially and has been ignored um, by the government. Both books are set around the course of a week and they um, focus on a crime that's happening and, and many people around that crime. And both books have quite a pretentious lyrical writing style and are interested in lots of sort of socio-political themes. This book has lots of discussions about um, development and class and poverty and gender and power. And this book is really interested in power dynamics um, to do with gender and class in particular. This book has lots of trigger warnings, um, it is quite brutal and yeah there are some really difficult bits to read but I thought this was absolutely phenomenal and in particular the audiobook was banging. I kept being like, because there's a few narrators for this one as well, there is one main narrator but there is a couple of others um, who read um, a couple of different characters viewpoints there are there are several viewpoints who uh, are consistent throughout the novel and then there are a couple of um, sections that are like a newspaper article um, or just perspectives from people who you don't hear from very much and I was like oh who is this narrator because I absolutely love her voice um, and I played it to Johnny and he was like yeah that's really a really nice voice it really works and I think it is in fact Tess Gunty I think she's the main narrator of this book and I loved that although I would recommend reading along with it because it, it is very wordy and there is also a comic book strip towards the back so you would miss seeing that if you if you only listened to it so yeah read a sample because this may not be for you but god it was a wild ride and it's one of those books that feels really experimental feels like it's trying new things it's a bit wacky, a bit out there, and does these really oddly specific deep dives, which is something Penance did, just, just goes really um, left field and, and talks about something that, you know, you could argue doesn't really have a place in the novel, and certainly that is what I, I read on a lot of the reviews. But I think all of those deep dives, as in Penance, allow you to sort of fill in the blanks of an aspect of um, a character's motivations and so they may feel really abstract and perhaps pointless but but they're not and they, they're building this sort of mosaic of the broader story of these people and I loved it and I also think that if done well this could be a really great mini series, although a lot of the book is quite stream of consciousness and that would be hard to achieve. But people are comparing this to a film like The Florida Project, um, which I see. Um, I see the sort of similarities in, in this one. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed this and would highly recommend it if you have any interest in it. So those are all the books I wanted to talk about in this uh, Favourites of the Year video. I would love to know if you read any of these books and if so, what your thoughts were on them. I would also like to know if you have any recommendations for books that you know sound similar to these because I would love to read more books like these ones and of course I would love to know what your favourite reads of the year were. I um, always find it really interesting to see which books um, people really enjoyed. It's interesting to see certain titles keep cropping up and then other people have mentioned books in their favourite reads of the year videos that I've just never heard of and I'm sort of building a list of books I want to read based on other people's favourites so I'd be very happy to add some more books to that list. So yeah, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye!